All of this and more from jihad expert Dr. Andrew Bostom. Dr. Bostom is author of The Legacy of Jihad and Iran's Final Solution for Israel. He is also associate professor of medicine at Brown University Medical School. Dr. Bostom, it's great to have you here. How are you today? Good. Thanks for having me on, Janet. Thank you. So what do you make of the fact that Iran was attending these international peace talks in the first place? Well, it's, you know, it's, they've been normalized, so why not? I mean, and, um, you know, it's just, it's just a very sad uh, continuation of the whole trajectory that was um, laid out uh, back in with that, uh, just shocking at the time to me at least, announcement uh, back in November of 2013, uh, that we were on a path to formal negotiations with Iran uh, towards uh, essentially what what it's done, of course, is legitimize their their long-standing nuclear aspirations. Um, that's much more dangerous than just participating in some conference about the Syrian morass, which is just right. a hopeless morass. Right. Um, but so it's just consistent with this larger, much more dangerous narrative that. Iran has been normalized, uh, and it, you know, it's it's eerily reminiscent uh, to me, um, given the symmetry of it. You know, they both occurred in in, in November, so November 1933, um, against the, against all rational precedents, uh, the Roosevelt administration normalized uh, relations with the Soviet Union, uh, right. the, the, the the giant terror state of its era. And uh, lo and behold, in November of 2013, we normalized, essentially, relations with, with Iran. Um, it's just a very sad saga. It is. Now, Iran has been the closest ally of Assad. What is Iran's preference as far as what happens in Syria? For, for, for the Americans who really can't understand very much about the foreign connections that are going on over there and playing into this whole situation, what would Iran like to see happen in Syria? Well, I, I, I mean, John, it's actually gotten even more, this is why I call it a morass, more complicated and more um, muddled. Uh, there's, there was a, a fascinating report. I don't know how much uh, stake to hold in it, but there was a fascinating report in Divelt a couple of weeks ago that uh, Assad really called in the Russians uh, it, it, almost in desperation at the level of Iranian influence um, in in um, in Iraq itself, uh, I'm sorry, in, in Syria itself. Um, in other words, the Iranians are now apparently proselytizing heavily. Uh, their you know Shia Islam, uh, traditional Shia Islam, and telling the Alawite population, their their patron, their former patron, their current patron, whatever in in, in Syria, that that they're they're not they're 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 really heretics, and and this apparently. According to this report, frightened uh, Assad ruling Alawites, and was part of the motivation uh, behind, you know, welcoming the Russians in, almost as if the Russians are, are in, in the eyes of the, of the uh, Assad regime, at least somehow something of a bulwark against the Iranians. I, wow. I, I mean, it's just unbelievably convoluted, and then and then the fact that we're still trying to parse out amongst these overwhelmingly overwhelmingly Sunni jihadist groups, which ones maybe we can give weapons to and which ones we can't, and are there some true secular Sunnis amongst them? If there are, they're, they're powerless. I, it's just such a complete mess. But, you know, certainly uh, Iran wouldn't mind, uh, in terms of its uh, hegemonic aspirations, it sees itself as, as the real heir to the caliphate, going all the way back to the forthrightly caliph. Uh, Ali, uh, that it still seems to be, believe it or not, its overarching foreign policy that it, it wants to establish uh, its version of a caliphate, uh, starting out regionally, and it, you know, its constitution still has international aspirations. But it is absolutely a a morass at this point. And really, Janet, we, we spoke about this some months ago. Um, that it, it's been a bipartisan U.S. failure uh, uh, of imagination. Um, in terms of the whole, uh, not only setting this process in motion uh, back in November of 2013, but the Republicans doing nothing to block it, uh, right. capitulating on the idea that, that, these, that these dangerous negotiations w w didn't have to be a formal treaty that would, that would require Senate advice and consent. That's exactly what the uh, Corker-Cardin compromise capitulation did. It ceded that right to President Obama, and there was only one senator in the entire U.S. Senate 
who went against that, and that was Tom Cotton from Arkansas. So we've created this morass over over several uh, 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 you know presidential uh, uh, tenures. We have. You're right. That's a great point. And what a lot of people were very mad about, just rank and file Americans who might not understand all the morass and the ins and outs of the deal itself, they were very angry that Obama and company went to the table with Iran when we had Americans detained over there. Now we have another one who has been arrested and detained oh. from what, yeah, in, in Evan prison. It's, it's, and this is the first one after the deal. What is going on here? It, it just it just adds insult to injury, not to mention the sort of obvious fact that that, that, you know, the Iranian people, and that now I'm talking about the people, the populace, the vox populi, are, kind of, are you know, throughout the whole negotiating process, we're, we're screaming death to America, and annihilate Israel, uh, in, in the streets, en masse. Right. And, and, that, and that right before Rouhani was elected, and of course he's supposed to be the moderate, and, and, and we can argue about the, the, their elections, they aren't really elections, they're C-elections, but regardless, I still think someone like him would win a true free and fair election in Iran. Why? Because 83% of the Iranian population, according to Pew, not according to, uh, you know, Iranian toadies, according to Pew, still wants the Sharia to be the law of the land. I I, I mean, so we have to understand that we're dealing with very uh, deep-seated attitudes that are popular. And I, I don't see any of our politicians coming to terms with this reality. I still hear ridiculous burblings about it was, it was Obama's fault in 2009 for not supporting the Green Movement. Well, I've actually studied the Green Movement. The Green Movement's spiritual godfather was Ayatollah Montezari, whose ideology is exactly, was exactly like Khomeini's. He died in 2009. Um, their political leader was a former... Uh, 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 Prime Minister of Iran under Khomeini, who's all, who was also a Khomeiniist. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I, we're, we're, we're really not getting our political class, our, our talking heads, to come to grips with, with just how absurd it is to, to tinker at the edges. There's only one solution, and it's been on the table for a long time, and that would be to destroy nuclear infrastructure there. It, right. it, and I'm not talking about, quote, going to war with Iran. By the way, they've been at war with us for 35 years, 36 years now. Yep. But that's the only solution, is tactical military strikes which destroy their nuclear facilities. Now, we've known about uh, two of the major ones from Iranian dissident groups, and unfortunately that happened to be sort of communist jihadist groups, and that's another story. But regardless, they gave us valuable information, the Mujahideen Kalk, uh, back in, the, in, in August of 2002, Janet. Now, the Bush administration did absolutely nothing about the Natanz facility, or a uranium enrichment facility, or the Iraq, not Iraq, Iraq, A-R-A-K, yeah. uh, plutonium facility. And to make matters worse, when Omer, then the Israeli prime minister, wanted to attack those facilities, perhaps others, after they successfully took out the Syrian reactor around 2007, Bush, too, denied the Israeli Air Force flyover rights when we controlled Iraqi airspace. Why? Because that would have undone the great gains of the surge. So this is a horrible bipartisan failure of imagination. Yeah, it sure is. Well, and and this is important for people to know. The New York Times even cites the fact that Ayatollah Ali Khamenei has made clear in his speeches and also in some of his writings that the nuclear agreement shouldn't lead to more cooperation with the U.S. And he has talked about, you know, warning the United States that was trying to infiltrate Iran. So it's not as if this is going to benefit us in any way, that all of a sudden they're going to like us. No, they're testing, they're testing intercontinental ballistic missiles. By the way, they have enough missiles to, to wipe out the little state in Israel. Right. They, have, they have missiles already, I think, that are actually pretty well perfected in terms of that range to put a nuke on a missile and, and launch it against Israel. Um, they're working on ICBMs to go after us and maybe yeah. to explode a weapon in our atmosphere and, and uh, you know, create, a, create a pulse, or almost like a horrible solar flare, which could right. mimic the same thing and fry our grid. I, I, I know this is absolutely preposterous. And by the way, the ballistic missile program was not even touched in, in these sham negotiations. Yes. On top of everything else that's now been reported, you know, about about the inadequacy of inspections, 
And even now, the first, I guess there was a report recently that the IEA uh, did made some attempt to inspect this um, uh, facility, this military facility in Parchin, where it's believed over many years that Iran was actually testing the detonating devices to detonate a nuclear warhead. And apparently there were, like, very clumsy, readily apparent efforts to clean up the site in ways that were also uh, allegedly in violation of certain agreements with the IAEA. I, I mean, it's, just, it's, just, it's endless, Janet. It's endless. It really is. It's it's horrible. And, and we all are sort of in the crosshairs of this. As you mentioned, the little Satan could already be wiped out by Iran. And we are the great Satan, as we've been called for many years. We're going to come back. Dr. Andrew Bostom is with us. And we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about Muslim migrants. But this is an interesting because Israel has the will, uh, presumably, to do something about those nuclear facilities. But without the backing of the United States, can they really go forward? Yeah, I, it, they have. Well, look, there's a ta- there was a wonderful tactical assessment, which I heard. It's, and it's really, I don't think it's that much outdated yet. It, it came out by, um, by Matt Kroenig, who of all unbelievably survives in the Georgetown uh, environment as, as an associate professor. Um, and he was actually involved in, in, in planning in, 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 within the Obama administration and sort of, I guess he got the gate, you know, but whatever. He wrote a book called A Time to Attack. And what he points out is that one of the problems with an Israeli attack is they just don't have the capability to do, do enough damage to the nuclear facilities. He, he, he ultimately came out and said, look, you know, because I, I actually got a comment for him for, for a piece I was writing. Um, and, and he said, look, in, 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 the, in the light of this, these kinds of agreements that were going forward you know, since November 2013, anything that delayed Iran would be useful. But he estimated that they'd only be able to delay tactically a, a couple of years, whereas we have these enormous bunker busters and the, and the delivering capability where we might be able to destroy the program you know, completely. Yeah. Um, and that's the history, Janet, of these yep. things. That, Absolutely. That once, you, once you blow them up, they, they tend not to be reconstructed. Yeah, that is an, an amazing thing, isn't I, it? I we're going to go a break. Look Dr. Iraq, Bostom, look at Syria. Hang look on just a second. We do need to go to a break. We'll come back. Dr. Andrew Bostom and I on Focal Point. Stay with us. Senior advisor to President Obama had given this interview to the Times of Israel and had admitted that the Iran nuclear deal virtually guarantees that Iran will get a bomb and said it tends to look at Israel, meaning the Iran deal, through a lens that is more competitive, more combative, that sees Israel more in problematic terms. What do you think is ahead for Israel and where it leaves Israel uh, in the wake of all of this? Well, I just, just make, let me make an editorial comment uh, about Mr. Ross. I mean, the fact that he didn't resign uh, a long time ago, if this is the way he felt, just really speaks to his character, or should I say his lack of character, and this is yep. his long history. But that's my editorial comment. Yep. Um, look, I, I, I'm very concerned that uh, the, one of the worst results of this deal, I mean, is, 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 uh, is the legitimization of, of Iran, And, of course, that makes it much more difficult for Israel or, frankly, the United States as well to then to then go ahead and and say, well, this is, you know, their nuclear program is unacceptable. Well, how can it be unacceptable if it's been legitimized? Uh, You know, and and it's part of an international agreement that the U.N., you know, jumps all over uh, and is is gleeful to to approve. it, that 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 was, and and again, that was the problem from the very from the very beginning. As far as as, as Israel goes, I, I I just I don't really I, I I'm, I'm as appreciative as I am of Prime Minister Netanyahu's rhetoric. This has always been his his failing. His 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 actions don't match his rhetoric. Um, uh, you know, I think that an attack should have taken place uh, uh, quite a while ago. I, I, it's, get, it's getting increasingly more difficult to do. I mean, after all, the, the Iranians are going to uh, fortify these facilities, uh, not only physically, but, but with air defense systems. And, and so um, I, I'm just very, very dubious that uh, Israel's going to going to operate to do anything. Um, I, I I just don't I just don't see any any signs of it. And the climate has gotten much worse uh, for them to strike uh, over the you know since November of 2013. Right. Oh, it's very disturbing. I want to switch gears a little bit because I'm anxious to talk to you about this big problem with the Muslim migration into Europe. We've seen a lot of stories. Austria, which had criticized Hungary's border fence, now says it's going to build its own border fence. We've got Germany now kicking out some Afghan refugees. We've got the highest rape 
uh, the rape capital of the West is now Sweden because of the mm-hmm. uh, Muslim immigration. What do you make of how this will change European civilization? Oh, look, I think this is the trajectory Europe's been on for quite a while. This is just like, you know, in in, in medicine, when we give when we give a rapid infusion, we call it a bolus. You know, uh, yeah. this is just this is just a this is just a large bolus of of of, uh, of, of Muslim migrants who have no intention of integrating in, in, into Europe. But the process has been going on slowly over over generations, and even even uh, within the Muslim communities that were existing and, and really were guest workers uh, initially. Uh, their their offspring uh, have have not been integrated, and it's not just because of um, you know European racism. Uh, you know, I think I think some of it exists, like in any other culture, um, but but largely it's it's an autonomous Muslim movement of conquest, and it, or hijra is what right. the Islam's prophet Muhammad called it. It's it's emigration, you know, to to, to spread Islam, and it's not it's not um, hidden. I, I mean, there are many many. Um, uh, prominent Muslim clerics throughout the world, in Europe, outside Europe, uh, who have spoken of, of, of their sort of manifest destiny. I mean, after all, Islam, uh, the Ottoman Empire, occupied half of Europe for five centuries. Uh, um, the whole Iberian Peninsula was under the Sharia uh, for seven centuries. Um, this, this, is, this is a return in, in, in the belief of many Muslims. Right. Well, it was one of the one of the things that was reported in the news in the last couple of days is the fact that some of these, well, a lot in some cases of the Muslims are disappearing from the refugee camps and nobody knows where they're going. There was one statistic, 7,000 of them have left the Brandenburg shelters and nobody knows where they're going. Are they going to ISIS? I mean, you can presume perhaps some of them at least may <sighs> be doing that. Who yeah. knows? Yeah. Well, look, there's also a report, uh, actually colleagues of mine are <laughs> getting it translated from the original Czech. A very, apparently brave Czech reporter went to Istanbul and discovered a network uh, that he's estimating to be 25,000 uh, uh, Turks that are involved in smuggling masses of Muslims uh, into Europe, apparently with the government, Turkish government, turning a, turning a blind eye. Um, you, you know, so, uh, look, this is... Janet, this is a process that's been going on a long time. Um, there's a there's a, a brilliant analysis of the EU's ideology, which is a very toxic ideology, uh, called Eurabia. Uh, that that's the title of the book. Although the book's title comes from a really delusive uh, academic journal based out of France by the same title that that was published going back to 1977 and essentially what it was arguing for was a, a synthesis between both sides of the Mediterranean um you know Mus- north african muslim manpower is what they envisioned at that time now it's muslims from all over the world apparently uh so, it, 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 it being being integrated in, in, into into europe uh, which was aging and that this would, you know, cause a flowering on both sides of the Mediterranean, and, and, and it was a great thing to do. And if it came at the expense of, of, of isolating and demonizing Israel and, demon, and isolating America, who cares? It, it's a right. great thing for the Euro-Mediterranean. Right. Uh, you know, so, so these are delusive policies. These aren't, these aren't conspiracies. These are, just, these are just crackpot European policies. And, and Europe has a history of coming up with these very dangerous ideologies, i.e. fascism, communism, etc. Yep. Yeah, um, and this is, just, this is just another delusive sort of synthesis between European and Islamic culture. Um, sure. And but you it, had... It, you it, had... Yeah, go ahead. I, I was going to say Angela no, I'm, Merkel. I'm just saying that, 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 that I, I think I think I think obviously you know the the the, the, the horrific internecine Muslim turmoil in the Middle East you know has unleashed uh, what I was calling a bolus of, of of refugees, but you know they could be absorbed much more regionally if it were not for these open borders policies of Europe and it, and and those. I think are part and parcel of this idea of integrating the civilizations, and right. and you know d- despite the difference between European conceptions of human rights, at least modern European conceptions of human rights, 
uh, and and the Sharia. You know, it's <laughs> it, right. it, it, it's just it's very delusive, Janet. And people have to understand that this is not happening by an act, by accident. No, it's it's and not. It's, but it's and interesting. I blame, and I don't blame the Muslim refugees. I mean, yeah. you know, it looks like uh, the land, you know land of milk and honey to them. And plus, by the way, it's their duty to con- to conquer and spread Islam. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. Why wouldn't you want to leave ISIS behind and go to Europe? I'd do the same thing. But, you know, you have Angela Merkel and David Cameron, who were the ones a few years ago, coming out and saying multiculturalism is a big fat failure and we need to reverse this because obviously we're not having the integration we had hoped. And yet Merkel is the one just everybody flow on in. I mean, what 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 is she thinking? Where is there no connection there between her understanding that multiculturalism is a failure and yet she's got these open borders and swarming in and, and uh, going into church? Churches now and taking out the pews and taking out the altars to accommodate the Muslim migration. It, it, there's a complete I, 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 disconnect because well, it's clear. It's clear to me, at least, that 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 those were faux expressions of of, of rejection of multiculturalism. They, they they they're not. They haven't rejected multiculturalism. They're doubling down on it. Yes. I, and and when it comes to Islam, if Islam is the most protected. Uh, uh, of of the various, you know, non-European uh, ideologies and religions. I mean, so no, they're 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 just liars and hypocrites. Uh, this is this is the proof is in the pudding. They are doubling at the despite that rhetoric, which you point out appropriately. They they are doubling down on on the worst and 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 sickest and most delusive aspects of multiculturalism. Um, and 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 hence they're they're just they're just abetting the, the, this situation. When you mention uh, the Hijra before the the Muslim uh, migration, immigration, uh, yeah, immigration, thing, immigration, yes, exactly, where they go to other lands and they establish the Sharia and so forth. Would you characterize this as a conquest, as an invasion, rather than immigration? Oh. There are some pieces out now where people are saying this really is more akin to what happened with the Germanic tribes back during the Roman Empire. Exactly. Exactly. No, I, I, I think I think that's largely the phenomenon. Look, I, 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 you know, there's one thing to deal with the generalities, and and the other is the specifics. I don't doubt amongst this mass of humanity that there are people that that um, that that really wanted to get away. Um, it is interesting, Janet, that you're not. I think most of those people. Are, are by and large either completely secularized Muslims to begin with, or non-Muslims. I mean, and and it's much more difficult, by the way, for the non-Muslim Christian populations, the Yazidis, to get into Europe. It's infinitely more difficult. And in fact, if you're going to look at 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 the at the refugee camps, you know, it's it, and just at least by proportions, because these are tiny minorities in that part of the world now, the Yazidis and the Christians. Right. Um, I would I would bet. That most of the most of the refugees that are stuck in the Middle East, in Turkey, in Jordan, etc., are I, I bet you the proportion is overwhelmingly non-Muslims that are forced to stay there, whereas those that are that are allowed free passage into Europe are overwhelmingly Muslim. We know that. Yes. So there's there's I think you you have to begin to piece all this together to say that sure on an individual basis there may be Muslims. Uh, even you know, still practicing Muslims who just want to get away from the from the havoc that's going on. But overwhelming, but 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 there's such, there's, there's no Christian getting through essentially, or, or or you you really have to find agencies like Barnabas that that that, that deliberately go in there and pluck them out and bring right. them over, as opposed right. to them just being able to freely flow. Um, so, so interesting. Yes, it really does look like a, a, a religiously inspired, a, a culturally inspired invasion. Well, I'll tell you what, there's so much more to talk about, but unfortunately we've come to the end of our time. But Dr. Andrew Boston, just love what you do and so appreciate your time. Thank you very, very much for being with us again. Thanks again, Jenna. Take care. All right. You take care.